try to make it brief. I've got another meeting, but uh, because of that heritage, sometimes I do go a little longer than, than I should. But what I want to do today is just kind of take us through uh, what the Republican delegation strategy has been, what it's going to be, uh, what uh, the history of this fiscal cliff, uh, some of the details of the uh, past special session we had and where we are at this moment in this regular session and where uh, we think it may be headed and uh, what the delegation strategy will be as it's headed in that direction. So first let me say this about the Republican delegation's strategy in the House. We meet, we have uh, several times a year, we do regionals, we have a retreat, so it takes us 12 months or nine months while we're off to start developing exactly what our strategy should be in the upcoming session. And so we've been doing that now for uh, the, the two years that we've had this fiscal cliff coming and that we've known that's coming. Let me say this, everybody has known that this is coming. Since the temporary taxes were put in place, everybody has known that there would be a fiscal cliff. So our strategy was, is, is kind of two-part. Uh, knowing that it was coming after the taxes were passed, we decided that the best strategy would be to look at spending first. Ring that tile out as much as we can on spending, find government efficiencies, and also look at spending reform as part of the budget process. That should be first and foremost in our minds as physical conservatives is to look at the spending first. And we will continually look at that as we went forward. So last year, knowing that the fiscal cliff was coming in June of 2018, we knew that $1.3 billion in a temporary revenue was gonna fall off, that we had a fiscal cliff coming. Our strategy was to try to present a budget that softened that blow in June of 18. Uh, kind of to put it a little different because you can tell by, by me sometimes I do experience a little dieting every, then, every now and then. It's a lot easier for me to start a diet when I'm 10 pounds overweight than till I wait till I'm 60. So last year, if y'all will remember, we presented a budget, it came out of the house, it was engrossed in the house, that only appropriated 98% of the REC projection. In other words, we wanted to hold back 1.7 to 2% of the projection, mind you. It wasn't real money, it was just projected to come in, and let's appropriate that at that level, which would soften the blow at the end of this year. So we narrowly lost on a vote in the House during the special session that, that began right after the regular session because we couldn't come to terms on that budget with the Senate. So we were forced into a special, and we narrowly lost by one vote. So what was adopted? The budget that was adopted that the governor and the administration was for and the Senate uh, presented, which is our existing budget now. They spent every dollar of that REC money, that Revenue Estimating Conference uh, forecast, then they added items that would grow from year to year. In particular, this year, this upcoming year, they added civil service pay raises costing an additional $60 million in this coming year. Several other things. They increased uh, the general fund spending in this existing year from last year went up 3.25%, which is outpacing the uh, private sector economy. And then the total means of financing went up 6.2%. So that's the budget that, was, that we were defeated on where we wanted to hold back up to 2% of that REC projection as a precaution and to soften the blow of this fiscal cliff. Now, had we done that, the fiscal cliff today, where we stand right now, would only be $270 million, a much more manageable number than where we began. So as I said, it was a lot easier, in our opinion, to go on a diet as a state government early on, knowing that this fiscal cliff was coming which in turn provided us the opportunity to dig out government efficiencies, to really look at cost and, and uh, spending reforms. So, brings us to the special session upcoming, or that we just got through, the special session of 2018. 
Well, as you can see from this chart behind me, the fiscal cliff went $1.5 billion in August of 17. In January, it dropped to a billion, 996 million to be more specific. Then in April the 12th, it was 648 million. And now after appropriations, uh, or excuse me, as the House sent their budget out, it's 495 million in our estimation. So that's the history of the fiscal cliff. So let's go back to that special session real quick. During that special session, our idea was to try to get some reforms passed while at the same time trying to solve the fiscal cliff that was coming up. The reforms that we pushed as Republicans on the House side included an expenditure limit that many states have gone to that's been extremely successful. This expenditure limit would be tied to uh, closely tied to economic indicators, meaning that the government spending would have to kind of stay in the same range as the private sector as it grows. And that's critically important if you ask me and as a physical conservative, because we don't want the government to outpace the private sector in such a fashion, which we've been doing as a state, that you're constantly having to come back and ask the citizens for more tax revenue and extracting more money out of the citizens and the family's pocket in order to pay for a government that grows and outpaces the private sector. The other thing that we looked at in this special session was the Louisiana checkbook. Many of y'all have heard about that. It's a transparency bill. Uh, best way I've heard it described, and I think uh, chuckle, is the guy sitting at home uh, drink, drinking his George Dickel at 11 o'clock at night can go in and see what the departments are spending. Therefore, we've uh, kind of hired on uh, thousands of auditors for the state that will bring attention to problems that they may see. Then the other thing that we did that was a big, in our opinion, a very much needed reform was Medicaid eligibility determination and fraud detection. Uh, we had a, a very good bill and special session that would address both of those needs. But as we remember, uh, we got to the special, uh, we got it midway through, the House had put several options on the floor. HB 23, which was uh, a renewal of some of the sales tax, along with cleaning some of the exemptions on the sales tax. We had uh, a few other revenue bills that came out of Ways and Means and made it to the House floor. Every day that we negotiated, every week, it seemed as if, as a Republican delegation chairman and being in all of these negotiations, that the goalposts would change. First it was, we want more income tax on the floor. Then the next day it was, it's not enough revenue. The next day it was something else. So that's kind of how the negotiations went. So if you'll remember, if you'll go back to February the 28th, we had HB 23 make it to the floor. So it came to the floor and that was going to uh, renew a quarter of a penny and take care of some tax exemptions. When it got to the floor, we had, uh, everyone thought that it was gonna be a bipartisan effort to pass this bill to fill some of the hole. Unfortunately on that day, the message was sent out to the floor to kill the bill because it wasn't enough revenue. And unfortunately the bill did go down uh, 34 Republicans stuck their neck out and voted for that bill, thinking that it would be a bipartisan effort to try to fill this hole. It was the first step. It would have gone to the Senate, come back, and hopefully we could have got out a special session with a remedy to some of the issues that are facing us on June the 18th. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough money. It wasn't enough revenue, so it was intentionally killed on the floor. Well. That kind of made it difficult to pass anything else for the rest of the special session. Although our efforts were ongoing day in and day out to try to come to an agreement with those on the other side of the aisle for us to be able to get something out of that session. We, I uh, think, negotiated in good faith. Uh, I didn't see it reported much on the 28th when that happened that, that uh, the, the Republicans basically, we held our end of the bargain up and unfortunately it wasn't enough revenue. Uh, we acted uh, you know, uh, in good faith, but we had some folks that weren't being reasonable when it came to trying to solve this problem. And then it was just too late. The special session ran out and we didn't get anything done 
as it pertains to the fiscal cliff. Then, as y'all remember, I've gone over this history. August 17, we're at 1.5 billion, went to a billion in January, 648 million in April due to the federal changes, and then down to 495 million on April the 19th. So where are we today and what about this session we're in today? Our strategy from the beginning with the Speaker of the House has been that we must pass a budget out of the House and then we will send it to the Senate for them to look at their priorities, to work that budget over, hopefully find some more efficiencies, and we would like to see them pass HB1. Why is that important? because we feel like on the House side that it's important to know exactly what holes you have to fill when you ask members to vote on renewing revenue, getting rid of tax exemptions or whatever may happen in a possible special session that the governor may call. So the most practical way of doing that is to go through the process, debate and discuss the budget, Find out where the holes are. Send it to the Senate. Let the Senate debate and discuss the budget. Let them look for other efficiencies. Draw information out of those departments. And then they pass a budget which reflects their priorities, which reflects what they have found out. Whether the governor signs it or it sits on, it de on his desk, it saves us a lot of work and a lot of distraction in a special session if it's called. So that's been our strategy all along. It gives us a roadmap as to what we need when it comes to the special session as far as solving the fiscal cliff. And it's real numbers. The other important part of that strategy was we can only deal with what we're dealing with today. We've been through, I guess, six special sessions now. And guess what? it never has turned out the way it was billed it was going to turn out. So the most practical thing to do is to deal with the, the revenue that you have at this point in time, try to come up with a responsible, balanced budget, and pass it. And then if we see it's just uh, too much of a big hole that you have to fill it, you know exactly where it's going. It's a much easier sell for a person in my position to go ask somebody to vote for some revenue renewals or to kill a tax credit or whatever it may be because they know exactly where that money will be going and they can tell their constituents exactly how it will be spent. So we're continuing to work on in this session uh, eliminating and reducing certain dedicated funds. I know y'all have seen a lot of that on the Senate and the House side. So that frees up general revenue. We have efficiencies that are recognized by departments that need to be written in to this budget as it goes through the process. And then we have other reform bills that could impact the budget as to where we stand now. Now, as we got to HB1, we had several, several discussions as caucus chairs with the Speaker of the House and the Chairman of Appropriations. The Friday before we got to HB1 in the committee, we spoke in the speaker's office and said to the other side, tell us where you want to spread this REC recognition, you know, that the $350 million that they recognize. Show us where you want to do it. Let's try to come to a mid-ground so that we can have the amendments ready in appropriations. And it's not just Republicans defeating all of the Democrat amendments or, or, or having a big fight there. We'll try to work with y'all on what we can do. That afternoon, they met as a delegation, the other side, and decided that that wasn't a course they wanted to take. Uh, the administration did not want HB1 out, is my understanding, and I know that on the floor as they were lobbying against it. So we went into Monday uh, without being able to put a coalition together bipartisan, so we worked the budget out and sent it to the floor. Then HB1 passed. And everybody remembers that day. It was a very uh, difficult day. We were working very hard. Uh, we had 55 votes, 53 Republicans, one Independent and one Democrat, passed it off the floor of the House and sent it to the, to the Senate. And in that budget, we were, were uh, able to fund TOPS at 80%.
We funded higher education, their core budget, 100%. Uh, we spread a little more money to the private-public partnerships, which uh, is very important to all of us in the legislature. And so the changes from the existing budget that we sent out, the budget that we're in now, we reduced the state effort by $485 million because we don't have that money available. We're dealing with the figures we have today, which reduces it from this existing budget to next year by 2.7%. And the total means of finance was reduced by 5% or 1.65 billion. So the fiscal cliff, again, and you gotta be careful because I am from the South and I might say physical and I'm, I'm sorry, it's fiscal. 1.5 billion to a billion to 648 million to 495 million. I want to remind everybody, had we done what we were asked to do starting way back here and those revenues, renewals had passed or those exemptions had passed, we would have extracted over a half a billion dollars too much out of the families of Louisiana's pocket. Because as we've said all along, this is a process and it begins to come down. It was coming down. So had we done that, we would have extracted too many tax dollars out of the public. So we're, where we are now, had we taken our budget that we tried to pass last year, we'd only be at $270 million without a whole lot of pain, if any, as we've seen in the past. And so it was probably pretty wise, our fate that let us wait or get to this point where we'll know exactly how much money or how much revenue or replacement or exemptions or whatever that it may take to fill any of the holes. But we're not through with that process yet. So what happens? The rest of the session, we're running a compressed schedule. And the House, uh, as of Friday afternoon, and talking to the Speaker and the Clerk, we're way ahead of schedule. Uh, depending on what the Senate does, we feel like, or I feel like, that we can get out early. If the governor chooses to call a special session, I believe we'll be able to get out uh, somewhere around the 18th of uh, May, is, is what the speaker has been quoted as saying, and I tend to agree with him, and then we can go into a special and look at addressing it. Ideally, what should happen is the Senate passes HB1 after they look at the priorities, that they look at the efficiencies, and they dig through these departments some more, and then the Senate and the House can agree on exactly what do we need to support to fix this issue if it, got, if it has to be fixed after their work. And then the government, the governor, excuse me, the Senate, the House agree on items to be put in the call if the governor's going to uh, present a call to bring us into session. If we can do that, ideally, I think we come into a special session with a much better idea of what has to be fixed and, and we can compress that special session because we know all of that, and then we put those bills out and those instruments out that we can vote on and hopefully solve this problem. So with that, I'll take any questions. Yes, ma'am. There's a lot of discussions. Now, I personally have not talked to uh, Senator LaFleur, but I'm sure that the Speaker and the Appropriations Chair has, Cameron Henry. I have talked to numerous Republicans on the other side that want to debate HB1, and they want to have the opportunity to look at the work we've done and for them to put their fingerprints on it. And, and you know, unless they get to that point and they're able to look at it, we don't know what the Senate's priorities are. And that's how this process works. Everybody says when we send a budget to the Senate, it may look like an uh, elephant when it gets over there, but it comes out as a giraffe. And that's part of the process. Then it goes to conference and we work those things out. But I know for a fact that many of my Republican colleagues in the Senate are anxious to get a crack at it and they want to work HB1. Representative yes. Harris, um, can you tell us Well, thank you, and I'm, I'm very proud. Uh, 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 oh, I'm sorry, thank you. 
Uh, the question was uh, uh, how we're funding the Republican delegation's uh, media campaign. Uh, and it's very simple. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that we're doing, but we charge ourselves $300 a piece dues every year. And that's where, where that's coming from. So we, every year we've had public relations uh, working for us. Last year it was another firm. This year we have Lionel Rainey's firm. Uh, and uh, we adopted as uh, the delegation and the policy committee and the executive board said we're going to be proactive this year. And that's what you're seeing. But that's where it comes from is out of our dues. Every member pays $300 a year to be a member of the delegation. And we instituted those. I think four years ago. So it's been an ongoing process. We're, we've had, by the way, we've had uh, right at 400,000 views of those videos. So uh, it's something that we've been needing, and I'll speak to that in a moment. Um, a lot of times it's difficult for us to get our message out. As y'all know, it's been in the press, the governor has the bully pulpit. So that's why we want to be proactive so that our constituents and the state as a whole knows what, what the Republican delegation stands for, what we're fighting for every, every day, and uh, this is critical to us getting our message out and being able to do what we're doing. Yes, sir. Uh, before Governor Edwards was elected, are you saying that uh, Louisiana did not have any budget issues or fiscal cliffs or mid-year cuts or anything like that? The question was, before the governor was elected, was I saying that the budget, or Louisiana didn't have any physical cliffs or budget problems? Absolutely not. If you will go back and look at the history, I was one of the original fiscal hawks. Uh, we've been working on this budget process. It's a long and arduous task because it's uh, been going on in Louisiana so long. I can point to, point to you articles from 2004, the town talk, where there was a much bigger fiscal uh, deficit than we have today concerning the general fund. It was $750 million under Foster, which made up 6.4% of the general fund at the time. And they addressed it without calling a special uh, session. They had to do the tough job of working that budget. Then you go back to 1998. I think that's just the progression of government sometimes that you have to have these discussions and there it's a long and arduous task until you get to the point where everybody can agree that this is where to fix it. But absolutely not. There were many things in the last administration that I didn't like in the budgets. Uh, and uh, part of them, of course, being spending one-time money on reoccurring expenses. That always digs a hole for you the next year. And I, let me say this. I do compliment this administration uh, for having a good uh, policy when it comes to uh, the budget as far as one-time money and those other things. Yes, sir. Uh, can you update us on the status of the checkbook initiative? And also, would you care to elaborate on uh, Representative Morris's frustration expressed last week that apparently uh, the administration may not feel like even the legislators are worthy of the level of scrutiny of the details within the budget uh, as a result of his bill not making it out of the committee that would have permitted that? Right. Uh, th the question was, where are we at with Louisiana checkbook? And secondly, uh, Representative Morris's frustrations about trying to get a bill through House and governmental that would have allowed the legislators to have the same information as the governor when it comes to putting the details on a budget and, and a cut specifically. Uh, to the point of the Louisiana checkbook, the speaker still has that bill. My understanding is it's going to work its way through the process. There's uh, a similar bill, bill that's coming out of the Senate. So that's something we've been working on. And as you know, as we go through, there's other parts that you find out that we may be able to incorporate in this, that, or the other. But yes, that's still on track. And I think it's something very much needed by the state of Louisiana. To Representative Morris's point, I think he had a very good bill, which allowed for me as a legislator to go to a department and ask that department subhead or uh, ask somebody, I want to see exactly what's going on with this particular program and we get all the details. What we found in the past, sometimes on appropriations, is we don't get all the information. We ask for the information, we ask for it, and we get little bits and pieces for, of it. And of course, it's the, it's the executive branch's duty and it's that constitutionally are bound to make sure that they operate and execute those laws on the executive side. 
and they have much more information than us. And as, as uh, we've heard in the past, if you're going to make the cuts, show us specifically where you're going to make the cuts. Well, my answer to that is give me the tools. I'll be glad to do it. Otherwise, we're going to have to do uh, department reductions and leave it up to those department heads to know what programs are effective and what aren't. But uh, Representative Morris's bill would have allowed us to get much more of the information we need, the same that the executive branch gets, in order to make what the governor has asked over and over again, those decisions of exactly where would you cut, what programs, what people, what vehicles, and that sort of thing. So uh, they did lobby against it. Uh, we didn't have the votes there that day, and, and I, didn't, I didn't see much uh, chance of that bill surviving through the whole process anyway. Yeah. Yes, sir. What is the root cause of the budget problems year after year in Louisiana? Well, I think that we're still operating under a 90-year-old centralized government that probably is way out of date to the modern economy. And we, we're centralized in that. We take money into Baton Rouge and we send it out to everybody else. <clears throat> we have a tax exemption and tax credit program, such as movie tax credits, which everybody in this no room knows I hate them that that money goes out of the door. We write a check to someone in California before I even get a chance to appropriate. Those are the problems that happen year in and year out. Now, can we fix those problems? Yes. Can we do it? I think in the, the, our present state, yes, we can do that with constitutional amendments. We can do that with legislation. We just have to keep working on it. As I said, it's a long and arduous task. But we do have a very centralized government and it's proven over some departments spend more money per capita than all of our southern uh, averages and even some of our northern averages. So we have to continually keep looking for those efficiencies. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, the question was, what's on the table, concern, uh, as it, uh, my opinion, uh, to, in order to close the $485 million gap? Well, I can tell you this, me personally, income tax is out. I will not vote for anything when it comes to income taxes because the $380 million or whatever it was, $60 million that was uh, a gift from Washington as they uh, changed the tax laws, I have to remind some of my colleagues, Tinkerbell did not fly over Baton Rouge and drop that in the Capitol. It is taxpayers that are paying that right now as we speak. And we started early on taking that out of their paycheck several months ago. So that is income tax related and it's deductions related. So that's off the table. I don't see the votes being there. I had 14 Republicans stuck their neck out in the special session, if you remember, on adjusting uh, deductions, and guess what? The Black Caucus did not vote with us or several of their members, and it went down. And I can assure you, especially after what we know now, it's, there's going to be some rev reservations by these uh, representatives to put their name on that again. So that, I think, is, is out. I think you will see and hear debate about renewing a portion of the penny, the sales tax, and looking at cleaning the rest of the pennies, as they call it, uh, bringing all of them in line when it comes to exceptions and uh, credits and, and such. So that's going to be your two areas. I think the call should pertain to one thing, in my opinion, if it was me, uh, I'm not running things on that level, but I'd put sales tax in there where we could address those issues. And the reason I say that, too, is believe it or not you hear a lot about we're the most sales tax in the nation that's true when you look at the locals combined with the state we're 31st or 33rd in the united states when it comes to state sales tax texas's sales tax is six percent and when you look at some other items it's even higher than that so i think as we work through some of the centralized government that we've talked about some things uh, i believe that the sales tax may be the the most realistic way to maintain your revenue, plus it goes with the economy. 
it, it grows and goes down as the economy goes and grows and goes down because why? It is a consumption tax. So I think it's a much uh, easier sell to try to get that passed and I would like to see if it does the possibility of it being talked about as a permanent step uh, in, uh, or at least having a long sunshine on it so that we don't go through this year in and year out as we continue to work and chip away at those spending reforms that we need to do. Okay. Anybody have another question? Yes, sir. No, sir, if you do the clean pennies, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase it. Where would the rest of the money come from if HB 23 last session, which was a quarter penny, but it also had cleaning of the pennies in it? In its, its form last year, it was worth uh, right at $320 million, okay? So had it passed in its original form, that's what it was worth. We have some other bills working across from the other side that looks at tax credits and some other things. Uh, and I'm not saying just a quarter penny. Somebody may say 0.35 of a penny. That's why it's critical, absolutely critical. We know what our needs are and we work HB1 through the process. If we don't do that, I think your chances are limited that you'll be able to convince enough people to vote for anything. So look, if we get through the process and we, we end up at 400 million, we know what we have to match. If, the, if that's 0.35, of a penny. No one says it has to be a quarter, a half. A, a, so there's a, a little uh, elasticity in there and the cleaning of the pennies and other tax credits as we go through the process. So, thank you. Appreciate y'all having me today.